Good day. It's glad to see you all and uh, glad to be with you around the world wherever you're looking in. And I thank all of you that uh, join us in these broadcasts and I thank you for listening. I know the Lord is going to bless you, especially today as we talk about disturbing the peace and how to restore it. And this is a day and time where this is a message that's very important because we have so much that's going on in the world that doesn't have peace. And I want people to get an understanding about it, what it takes to get that peace back. And, uh, you know, it didn't run around riding, trying to get everybody to respect you when you don't do the things that are respectable, you know. And so we, we know that we're living in the last days, and these are the things that were promised to us that in the last days, there will be perilous times. Perilous times come from perilous people. And uh, if you change your heart, then that peril will go away. Amen. But until you change your heart and your mind and you start living for the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to have perils. And I want to tell you today that that's the only way you can have peace restored. Now, God doesn't tell you you're going to be without peril in, the li in your life. He says that there's going to be tribulation, and everybody has had some. And if you haven't, you haven't, you just was born yesterday, right? <laughs> so I'm trying, to, now I'm trying to get you to think about it, because the Bible tells us that Jesus actually came to give us peace. He is actually called the Prince of Peace. And when we know that He is in our heart and that we're obeying Him, we will have that peace restored. But I'm going to head myself. I'm going to read to you a scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, and it says, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all of our tribulation, all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You have to have a comforter. God sent His Holy Spirit to dwell in you. And that's the only way you can have comfort in this life. Because there are people insisting on living in the world. They're replacing peace with something else. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, you know, let me ask you a question before we get into that, that scripture. How would you define peace? It's the absence of anxiety. Perhaps more important question that we could ask you would be, do you have peace in your heart? Now in your heart, and I, I wanted to tell you this, that you know, when we put our hand on our belly or our heart and stuff like that, sometimes we can feel things that come from the Lord. And when you're at peace with Him, you can feel that inside. You know, He says that out of us is going to come rivers of living water. It doesn't if He's not there. But it, if He's there, that and peace comes out of us. You know, we've had people that would come into our house and one of the things they'd say, boy, this is a peaceful place. One of the things that we try to keep in this place is peace. And you know it doesn't take but one warfaring mind to come into this house and change the very environment of the house. I can feel it as soon as they come through the door. I know what's going on in the mind. Well, I don't know exactly what's going on in the mind, but I do know that something's going on in that head that has just changed the environment around me. Now, I try to keep the peace in the Powell House uh, all the time. And, you know, it's not, I, I want to tell you, it's very difficult sometimes because of the people that come. We have a lot of people every week that come in and their, their heads are filled with war. It, they're filled with anxiety. They're filled with anger. They're filled with hatred, bitterness. As we were talking about just a few weeks back on bitterness, 
you know, and they got a root of bitterness in them. They, they're not forgiving people. They don't know how to let go of things. And they rehearse things in their mind until they actually it cannot have any peace at all. Uh, I call them demonized because that's what it is. You know, the demon gets in the head. That's where he's going he's gonna to shoot for, you know, when he's coming to you. He's going to get in your mind and he disturbs the peace. Now, when years ago, when I was a kid, uh, I served on a police department. And while we were there, there were times that I'd get calls. And one of the, the things that they'd call me and they'd say, well, they're disturbing the peace. That was a time where you couldn't play your stereos loud. Uh, you couldn't shoot and do firecrackers and fireworks. You couldn't, there was just a lot of things you couldn't do. Uh, I really wish we could go back to that time. Because now the world is filled with and, and terrible noises. The, I mean, the world is filled with noise. And most of it has nothing to do with God, praise, and that kind of thing. Even the churches are filled with people that they come on Sunday, but through the week they're a part of the world. Now that's, the Bible says, come out of the world and be a separate people. You're not supposed to be like the world. You're not supposed to act like the world. And you're supposed to be living for God. You can't have the peace of God in you if you're not doing that. As a matter of fact, you know, the moment that you start in, engaging your mind in anything worldly, that peace is disturbed. You can sit down and watch things on the news in the evening. Listen to me. The moment you cut the television on and you start listening to those talking heads on television, most all of them are demonized and don't even have a clue that, I mean, I go to church, it doesn't matter. If you don't have the peace of God in you, something else is in you. And it's causing you to be disturbed. You know, and isn't that what disease is? Disease. It comes from the spirit. And the thoughts create for the spirit the atmosphere inside of you. And so when we start looking at the scriptures, we understand what God say, is saying to us that He came to give us peace in a world that didn't know peace. You know, that's one of the things they were saying. Peace on earth goodwill toward men that was the angels making a declaration on the night our Savior was born. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, Paul tells believers, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Now, did you hear what the Word of God said to you? You have to allow peace to rule over you. Anytime that peace is disturbed, you need to go back to point zero, repent of whatever you were doing, ask God to forgive you of what you did or whatever you were thinking about, and let Him restore that peace. That peace is supposed to rule your heart and your mind. Actually, the church is filled with sick people. And the reason it's filled with sick people is because they are warring all the time. They are allowing their mind and their thoughts uh, to rush them into a place where there is no peace. And then the body will resp uh, respond to that. That's why we have disease. So peace is more than a mere word though, it's, or an idea or a feeling. It's actually an awesome gift of God that He gives to those who through faith in Jesus Christ belong to Him and walk obediently in His ways. Amen? But you see, obedience is necessary as well. You can't have the peace of God doing your own thing. You have to obey Him. He didn't create you to do your own thing. He created you to do His thing. That's your purpose. All people, I had people this weekend from Harvard University and that friend on Facebook and he's a Harvard professor and he, he was talking about the 
purpose in life and that kind of thing. I said, have you picked up the Bible lately? You could actually cut through some of this stuff that you're trying to think about and your philosophies and you can go right to what God says about why you're here. He created you. He's your creator. Uh, he put the spark of life in you from the womb. You came forth with a call on your life whether you were uh, going to find it and live it uh, it still is something that He gives you freedom to reject. But the purpose that God has for every living human being was something that He had in His mind before you were ever conceived. Before the world began. He knew you by name. He knew what the future would hold for you. He knew the plan that He had for you. And He wanted you to find Him so you could actually find His plan for you. Amen? So, God has provided His peace for every believer. Now, let me say this to you. Believer needs to be qualified. I go to church, I believe. No, if you believe, you do His will. A believer is going to do the will of God, not say that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and that's going to be... And there's going to be a lot of people that will burn in a godless hell because they think they're a believer, but they never obeyed Him. They didn't pick up, pick up their Bible. They rarely go to church, you know, Christmas and Easter, right? Is that a believer? No, see, they, they don't know what God expects of them, and because of that, they can ab absolutely say that they believe in Jesus Christ. Because of that, their soul is still in jeopardy. Until they find a personal relationship with Him, their soul is in jeopardy. And again, I'm saying this to all you believers, that if you say you're a Christian, that means Christ's light. You have given up your life to live the life that the Father wanted you to live. It's not you doing some Christian thing, some service on Sunday, and things like that. It's not that. You can go to hell doing that every Sunday. Amen? So, uh, God has given us this peace as believers. But a believer is somebody that obeys Him, knows His will, and obeys Him. If there's an absence of peace, it's because we have not let peace rule over our heart. How many of you have ever met somebody and they're, they're just troubled all the time? They, you know... They sweat every little thing. Every little thing. And because of that, and, and they, they grumble and complain and mumble all the time about life and it not being what they want it to be. And all, Listen to me. It's not going to be the absence of all of that trouble in the world that gives you peace. It's that you have a relationship with a God that doesn't give you peace like the world does. The world doesn't give you peace. You might have the cessation for about 10 minutes until they can find something else to complain about. Amen? So, or in other words, we haven't practiced and applied the truth of His peace to our lives in a way that governs our hearts no matter what our circumstances may be. Amen? And all of us have had those kind of times. But God actually expects us to repent of those things that are causing that peace to go. You don't, you, know, you don't do justice to God and by calling yourself a Christian and then your every moment is filled with some sort of a complaint, a murmur. Jesus didn't do that. The disciples that were around Him did that till they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then that stopped. They were changed. Their whole life was changed. So let me see if we can get this thing moving. We will experience God and the all-sufficient peace when we believe and practice and follow the truths that are in the Word of God. Amen? When we place our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. That's one of the rules. 
you, to have His peace, you've got to actually place your trust in Him. How many of you have ever doubted the Lord? Something was happening. You know, you wondered if, if God was going to come through for you. Then you started doing what you do all the time, murmuring, complaining to God that you, I don't know if you're going to do it. Why aren't you doing it for me? You know, like you're going to tell God. No, no, you humbly go to God. You can request, that's a supplication, that He do anything. You can beg Him. But when you start trying to tell Him, there's a problem. Uh, you just tried to exchange seats with Him. And that doesn't work for Him. So, until we have peace with God through our faith in Christ's payment for our sins with His death on the cross, we won't have His peace or our assurance of our eternal destiny. How many of you know for certain that you're going to heaven when you die? And I, I hate to bring this up, but everybody's going to die. Okay. Everyone is going to die. The face of God's righteous judgment is going to be the next thing you will, you will have to face. Only believers can know ab uh, with an absolute certainty that they will live forever with Christ in heaven. This eternal assurance is available to all who repent of their sins. What does repent mean? Change of, Change of mind and heart. Stop doing it. You can't continue those habits and behaviors and think that you know, you're going to heaven. It just won't happen. You have to change masters. When you're still living like the world, you are still the world. When you change masters, then you have a change of heart and mind. And then you want to obey God because He's put, he's put His Spirit in you to obey Him. Amen? Everyone's going to die though. And so we've got to look at this that eternal assurance only happens to people that repent of their sins. Only happens for that. Uh, and those that trust in Christ's death on, on, the, uh, on their behalf and surrender to, uh, their lives to Him as Savior and Lord. So, I have people sending me messages while we're doing this. Can you imagine? <laughs> the second one is, when we believe that God sovereignly controls all things, including our personal lives. Does God control your personal life? Are you telling Him what you're going to do when you get up? And then yeah, all day long, you just do whatever you want to do, and then you go to bed, you, you don't ever acknowledge Him through the day? Everything that we do, we're supposed to come to God with. We need His approval to have His peace. Well, how important is that peace? Well, that's why disease comes on you. Because when you start allowing something else to rule your heart and your mind other than God, your body is going to suffer. Your body is going to get sick. You're going to have diseases. And those diseases can kill you. The wages of sin is what? Death. And so those are the things that happen to people over and over and over. They think that they're going to heaven just living their day-in, day-out life and never acknowledging God at all. So, <clears throat> reliance on this truth frees us from anxious wandering. Feeling, trying to fill up your life with some worldly thing to give you peace and comfort. Uh, you know, if you're going buying things and thinking that all the, the more that you buy, the, the happier you're going to be. And all, listen to me. The next time your car breaks down, tell yourself you're happy. Especially when you're writing the check out for somebody to have to repair it for you. Or you get a hole in the roof. Tell yourself you're happy when you have to climb up in the heat of the day and put a new shingle on it and patch a roof. See, I'm telling you, nothing is going to give you peace in this world except Jesus Christ. And He can give you peace in the middle of your storms. Amen? So, Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His sovereignty rules over all. How many people does it rule over? All. 
there are people that just are not going to situate themselves for Him to rule over them. Can you imagine what that means? Because your spiritual relationship is dependent upon who is ruling you, controlling you, controlling the outcomes of your life. Amen? If we don't believe this, we go through a life of futility trying to control every situation or thinking that we're controlled by other people. It's not possible to be controlled by other people. The only way that you could be controlled by them is to let them get in your head. How many of you want somebody else in your own head? <laughs> Isn't that a problem? Okay. But knowing that our lives are under God's authority should bring us great peace and assurance because He promises to work everything together for our good to those who love Him and called according to His purpose in Romans 8, 28. Three, when we trust the Lord to meet all of our needs. How many of you have ever taken things out of the Lord's hands and said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make it and, I'm gonna, and then you're going to boast about it, right? Hmm. Believing this true, <laughs> truth though, that the Lord meets all of your needs, and your daily concerns have, you know, about having enough or not having enough. How many of you have ever had that in your mind? I don't know how we're going to make it. Yeah, I know you have. At some time in your life, you didn't know if you were going to make it. You know, Lord, where are we going to get the finances for that? Some sort of emergency came up. All of a sudden, you're thinking, oh, my Lord. I was thinking the other day something like this, you know, that that God has blessed and blessed and blessed, and uh, and every time we had a need, I don't I don't even sweat it anymore. I just say thank you, Father, that you're going to take care of all my needs, and I just go on about business. The hospital sent me a check this week, overpayment. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. <laughs> He's got money that I don't even know coming in, you know, and that kind of thing. So, uh, Paul gives us an assurance that, uh, that God will supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory uh, in Christ Jesus in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Who's going to do that? God. God the Father made you, and He is taking care of His children. But you have to be His child for that to happen, right? Throughout the Scripture, God makes similar promises of provision for His obedient children. Therefore, His peace is available to all who are willing to believe that He tells the truth. If you don't believe that He's going to take care of your needs, that is called doubt. And when you don't trust God for your needs, then you try to do it yourself. And then that's a struggle, isn't it? You ever have to... You know, Take up and say, well, I've got to do it, you know, because God's delaying the answer. And well, He might be delaying that answer because of something you might do. Hmm. Well, dwell on, when we dwell on all of the uncertainties and forget God's promises and try to carry out the burden on our, on our own. Instead, we take our concerns to the Lord and, and, in prayer so that His peace, which surpasses all comprehension, understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And that's Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. I want you to hear these things because to go back in the direction of peace is what God intends in every situation in life. When we maintain a clear conscience, how many of you have ever had a conscience that wasn't clear? How many of you know that steals the peace from you? Inside you know you're not right. You don't want anybody else to know you're not right, so you put on a face. How many of you have ever worn that face? Well, everything's fine. Well, it ain't fine. If God's not in your heart, it ain't fine. I can tell you that. <coughs> so, but if you had that clear conscience, this shields and protects our peace. Jesus said to His disciples, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives uh, do I give unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful or be afraid. If 
you read in King James, John 14 and 27. God wants you to be at peace. He tells you this over and over and over, and you don't have any clue what you're missing until you actually live in it and have to deal with something outside of it. I don't want my peace disturbed, and anything that tries to do that has to go away. It just has to go away. So, if we've allowed sin into our lives, our consciences will gnaw away at the, at the peace because we're being disobedient to God. How many of you know what that means? You've done something wrong. You knew it was wrong. Then all of a sudden, inside of you, your conscience is eating you alive. Well, I can't tell anybody because of my pride, right? I'm not going to have anybody pray for me because they know that I did I sinned. Like you think that you think anybody else thinks you're not a sinner? When pride gets in, the peace is disturbed too. You've changed masters. The Prince of Peace goes out and the Prince of Suffering comes in. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? So, if we try to find relief by seeking substitute serenity from the world, it will be short-lived because the only way to have genuine peace is to turn back to Christ in repentance and receive His forgiveness and His cleansing. It's not enough just to get forgiveness because how many of you know that you need your conscience sprinkled because you, you'll sit around and beat yourself up even after you've said, I'm sorry. But you have to have your conscience sprinkled from that evil conscience. That means you've got to get the, the power of Satan out of your head because he will still bang you on the head and tell you what a, a lousy person you are. He, he tempted you and then he turns around and condemns you. But when your conscience is free, you can say, yeah, I've sinned in my past and that kind of thing, but I repented of that and the Lord has sprinkled my conscience. So now I'm here to tell you that that isn't going to work for you. Amen? We're supposed to do that. After we've been forgiven, we're supposed to rise up with a case against doing that again. Amen? All right. So anyway, five, when we accept our ourselves the way that God has made us. How many of you have a problem with your image? How many of you have ever tried to go on a diet? How many of you want a facelift? <laughs> a hair transplant? <laughs> See, when you, when you know who made you, then you know that he had, you know, this guards you from trying to change something about yourself that you don't have any control over. Amen? Amen. Uh, fat happens. Boldness happens. Right? And, uh, and you can go and pay thousands of dollars to have a weave and that kind of... And I see people right now that give these weaves in their hair and stuff like that. And listen, I want to tell you something. The hair they've got is going to turn loose and the weave won't have anything to stick on. And I see it, you know, it starts going away. That beach starts rolling back. <laughs> so, <laughs> God has created each one of us uniquely with our own personalities and abilities. If we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have also been given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit who indwells us, and that's in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. It is through these gifts that He enables us to serve one another, yet sometimes we are not uh, content with how God has designed us. You look in the mirror and talk to yourself bad. Look, uh, I know all of you can't be as pretty as I am. <laughs> look at that. Everybody laugh. Oh, so look, it doesn't matter what I look like. It matters what's in my heart. Inner beauty is always greater than outer beauty. And if you've got Christ in your heart, you've got inner beauty, and it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. By the way, when we come back, we'll be in 30-year-old bodies, and we'll all look alike. Amen? <laughs> all be 
the same height. No, no big I's and little U's. So, yeah, go read that in the second revelation of John, okay? So, it's through our Holy Spirit gifts that He enables to, us to serve one another, not be served. And I see people, and even in the body of Christ, that think that they're there to be served. They're there to get, you know, they're, they come in like this instead of like this. The service is not there. You can tell when a person has changed because they want to serve. Collectively, though, the body of Christ is not doing that. They are really sterile in the service area. But the Bible tells us that a person that serves is the greatest person in the kingdom. So the one that serves the most is the greatest person in the kingdom, right? And then if we want to be served, uh, if you're in the kingdom at all, you've got to, you've got to hear both sides of that coin, right? So, yet sometimes we aren't content with what God is doing in us, how He's designed us, and we must learn to tr uh, trust the wisdom and be satisfied with His choices for, uh, for us because only then will we have peace in our heart. Well, I don't like what you made. Have you ever said that to God? I'd like to look different than this. Why don't you give me a miracle and make me look like a movie star? See, you're looking at the wrong thing. It's the inner man that God looks on, not the outer man. Everybody looks at people and say, well... Well, they're handsome or they're beautiful and that kind of thing. And they're, you know, look, God even uh, sent a prophet in that said to, uh, to Jesse that one of his sons was handsome and tall. And surely this was the person that God was going to choose. And God said, yeah. A little ruddy boy out in the field, you know, watching sheep. Not one sitting on the benches in the house somewhere. So we've got to learn how to trust that God is doing what He's doing and He had a purpose to make you just like you are. Are you beautiful? Can you say that to yourself and mean it? Say, you're looking at the wrong mirror then. If you look in the mirror and you see your heart and it's not beautiful, give it to God. He'll make it beautiful. Amen? Amen? Okay. Six, when we all have a sense of purpose for our lives that protects us from the plague of emptiness. How many of you know that you have to have a purpose? People that sit around don't want to work and that kind of thing, they don't have a purpose. They watch television all day and they think they're all right. They play on their iPads and, and, and tablets and cell phones all day. And they think that's their purpose for existing? That you haven't met God yet. That has nothing to do with Him. That's the world. And He said, come out of that. Many people today struggle with feelings of emptiness. Why do they do that? But Paul tells us uh, what God says about believers. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. His purpose for us includes living godly lives by following and obeying Him and walking in His ways. Although many people try to fill that void with uh, their lives and all that's in the world and all the world offers, but a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the only thing that can truly fill and satisfy that empty heart. The closer you draw to Him through prayer, through His Word, through obedience, through service, and with your spiritual gifts, the more of His peace you will experience because that is what He's looking for. He will fill you with His peace, with His presence, because that is is what He did when He was here. You can truly say, I'm a Christian, when you have that peace in you. 
But if you don't have that peace, you need to go back to God and talk to Him and get your heart in a place, a stage of life with Him in a relationship and allow Him to have His way with you. I've had people say to me that they didn't want to pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, that Lord's Prayer, uh, it starts off like this. Thy will be done. Well, I can't pray that. He might make me do something I don't want to do. Yeah, there's the problem. There's the problem. Okay? So, again, the closer we draw to Him, the more peace we're going to have. Seven, when we have a sense of competency in our life, it's because of Christ's sufficiency. Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's no longer us, but Christ in us. Knowing that God equips us for whatever He calls us to do protects us from failures that result from an overwhelming feeling of inadequacy. How many of you have ever felt inadequate? It's because you have missed the purpose. If you're serving the Lord's purpose, the Lord's purpose, I didn't say yours, then you will have adequacy. You will make fewer mistakes. You will be doing what He gives you the power to do. He will give you the knowledge and the wisdom that you need to do it. And you won't be failing every time you turn around and you won't have people making these kind of remarks to you that, that are kind of sad, you know, and talking about how inadequate you are. People that lose jobs lose them around a feeling they have in their head. Well, I'm, they, don't, they don't approve of me. They don't appreciate me. You're looking for somebody outside to give you approval, not inside. If you have the Lord's approval, if He opens the door and you do what He says, then you will have the approval that you need. And if He opens the door, no man can shut it. Amen? So, we're given spiritual gifts to enable us to serve the Lord as He desires. When we depend on Him and live in His sufficiency, we not only experience His peace, but we also become a witness to others as they see how God can work in, in a life submitted to Him. We become an absolute witness to others because we're doing the will of God. Now, I want you to get upset. I'm just asking you to consider what the Word of God teaches about this. It's that ignorance that people have that causes them to suffer. The Bible tells us that. You know, my people suffer for a lack of knowledge. Amen? So, eight, when we have a sense of belonging. How many of you belong? By the way, you know that's why God actually instituted the church so that we could be with one another and that He would be in our midst. And there's people, you know, I, I, over the years, I'm going to lead the church. And I kind of, wait a minute, you don't have a clue what you just said. I'm going to leave. That's a decision you're making. I'm going to lead the church. You're walking away from a body of believers and you leave and you don't realize what you just did. You put yourself in jeopardy spiritually. Because, again, if you don't forgive people whatever offense that you're taking, and a person that has the love of God in their heart does not take offense. So, when you're not forgiving, we, we, we can go back three weeks and we can tell you about that sermon, you know, on... And, you know, if you don't forgive others, Christ will not forgive you. Amen? So, that offense that, that makes you want to walk away from a, a, a body of believers where God has joined you together, that offense that's in you is causing you to do something that can cost you your spiritual destiny. I should have heard an amen or an oh me. Anyway, <laughs> when we come to Christ, we have peace knowing that nothing can separate us from Him. However, this does not mean that we will never have the experience of being rejected from others. There's always going to be some ignorance in somebody that thinks that 
they're better than you or they're smarter than you or they're not no look we're all the same in God there ain't any big guys and little you's amen okay God doesn't reject you he promises he'd never leave you or forsake you but it doesn't say that you can't leave him and forsake him and that happens a lot amen there's a great falling away right now in this world Psalm 37 and 37, it says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Think about that. When you're walking in the perfections of Christ, then you're going to have the, the, the peace that God promises to give to you. Philippians 4, 6 through 8 says this, Be anxious for nothing. How many of you have ever been anxious? Worried about everything. Concerned about everything. Well, look, put it in God's hands because He said, Cast every care upon Him, for He careth for you. You are not supposed to carry a burden around. You're supposed to give it to Him and let Him deal with it. You don't know. My children, my grandchildren, my, my mama, my daddy, my what, whatever it is you worried about, you are already disturbing the peace of God by not doing what He said. He said, Cast every care. How many is every? Every care upon Him, for He careth for you. Let Him deal with it. And then rejoice in Him that's going to take care of that. Okay? So, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, with prayer and petition, supplication, begging God. <coughs> present your request to God, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which will suppress all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You need to put this into action. You're not going to guard your heart and mind. You're going to rehearse this until you get miserable. But when you allow the peace of God to come in, He will give you that peace and that assurance that He's going to do something about it. And you let Him do, about, do something about it. You don't tell Him how to do it. Just ask Him. Amen? So, uh, it will guard your hearts and minds in, uh, in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent, excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. He gave us a laundry list of what we need to think on other than the things we think on. And He tells us when we think on those things, we'll have that peace abiding in us. So, down to closing. Everybody was going, Amen. God's peace comes to us when we humble ourselves before Him. You don't go in touting who you are and what you've done for Him and all that kind of stuff and you owe me something. There's a lot of people that think that's the way you pray. It doesn't work. Uh, he doesn't give you mercy and grace when you come in like that. You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He lives you up. Every time. You know, he, you, know you are nothing but dust, right? And so when you come to God, you, you need to see it that way. That you're going before an almighty God who's worthy of all of our praise. And when you go in, you don't go in there like I'm somebody. You go in there in humility and God will answer you. One of the biggest hindrances to prayer is people that don't know to go in humbly before Him. Pride will keep you from ever receiving what you're asking for. Amen. So, uh, <clears throat> we have to humble ourselves before Him, acknowledging and repenting of our sin, believing in Jesus for the forgiveness and salvation, and submitting ourselves to Him as our Lord. Jesus is not just my Savior. He's my Lord. That means master, teacher, director, the person that's going to cause me to walk in right paths. He will cause me to walk in right paths. 
Okay. Let's pray. Loving God, please grant me peace of mind and calm for a troubled heart. Give me the strength and the clarity of mind to find my purpose and to walk that path that you've laid out for me. I trust your love, God, and I know that you will heal our stresses just as the sun rises each day against the dark of night and rise and, and gives uh, night rise and gives me peace of mind and heart. Now I ask these things for your name's sake and your glory in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen.